Thank you, everybody, for coming. Good morning. How'd you like the keynote lecture? You can clap. It's OK. You might want to wait until afterwards. So I'm Adam Levine. I'm the assistant director here. I'm kicking water over. Thank you all so much for joining us uh, for a conversation about data visualization. Um, so most of you will have seen me speak at some point over the course of this conference about the things going on. So um, some of the responsibility for organizing this has fallen to me. In doing that, certain things fall through the cracks. One of them is the title of this session. So if you're wondering what data visualization is about, a more apposite name is probably data visualization and visual literacy, uh, which is why we're talking about it here. So the structure of the session is going to be uh, as follows, plus or minus. Uh, I'm going to do about 10 minutes of introductory remarks, um, sort of setting the stage for things. Uh, I feel very privileged among this audience. Typically, when I talk about anything related to visual literacy, the lion's share of the time is spent defining and describing what visual literacy is. Here we can do the opposite. I'm going to take an understanding of visual literacy for granted. Um, maybe not the best thing to do, but in an hour, it's about all we've got. Uh, after uh, my sort of brief front matter, um, brief-ish front matter. Then we're going to turn to a panel discussion with our panelists who I will introduce in just one second, um, which is why I'm overflowing with stuff because they're so interesting and accomplished. Um, and then we're going to open it up to questions. Uh, we'd love to hear from you and we'd love to engage in a dialogue about some of the things we bring up today um, and hopefully probe some of the uh, points that are made around data visualization a little more fully because uh, one of the things that I think should emerge out of this is a conversation about uh, audience, uh, who things are produced for, and in this case, who data visualizations are produced for and who they're meant to serve. Um, and there have been some really interesting conversations about data visualization, presentations about data visualization, um, very few of which I think are targeted at average people. Uh, I think they are, tend to be discussions that talk to in-groups. Um, and hopefully this will be uh, not the definitive uh, introduction to data visualization, right, but a start towards a more general conversation around it. So with that, um, a few notes about our panelists um, moving uh, from my left or to my left and to your right. So immediately to my left is Shazna Nessa, um, the director of journalism at the Knight Foundation. She has, the, which is a very new position, September? September, so very new. Um, she just moved to Miami in the past week. Um, she has 15 years of journalism experience, including uh, at the Associated Press, where she was the deputy managing, at, at Associated Press in New York, where she was the deputy managing editor of editorial products and innovation. She also launched Condé Nast Business Magazine website. She's taught at Columbia and the City University of New York and the graduate schools of journalism and created the visual design course at CUNY. Uh, she also, she graduated from the Sorbonne uh, and was very recently a John Knight Fellow at Stanford University. Moving along, we have Ray Cha, who's a user experience designer and project manager with a focus on tools and applications. His projects have ranged from designing mobile apps for two-person startups to working with Fortune 100 companies on visualizations. He's a bachelor's in mechanical engineering and engineering and public policy from Carnegie Mellon University and a master's from NYU in their interactive telecommunications program. Um, and has his firm is called Weather Pattern. And then all the way to my left, who's on paper, because I ran out of time scrambling to take care of your abstracts, um, is Christina Norin, um, who has very extensive experience with data visualization and big data in particular. Um, we are actually collaborating with her at the moment on her newest venture um, in the art space on a firm called, with a firm called Aura, about which potentially more later. Um, but until very recently, it was under the moniker Stealth Mode Startup. Um, her experience is long and distinguished, including uh, being acting as Senior Vice President of Zwara um, and Senior Vice President of Solutions at Splunk, which uh, she was employee number 10 of and IPO'd. How long ago did IPO? 2012 or 2011? 2012, and at last tracking is now worth $7 billion. Um, Splunk is the sort of default uh, data visualization tool for big companies and governments uh, around the US and around the world. Um, so a very interesting and distinguished panel representing 
uh, journalism, user experience, design, and sort of the business community in a wide range of ways, and then sort of big corporate, big data visualization. So very excited to hear what they have to say to us. So now that I've introduced them, they can sit tight for a little bit. So I'm gonna start actually by showing you a video. Um, and I want to just work under the assumption that no one here understands how data visualization can be useful, right? Data visualization is in short, right, the visualization of data. We're generating lots of data, whether they're time series data, historical data, or data that we're generating through all these devices that we're wearing and carrying around. And it's really difficult to make sense of that data. However, um, as one of our panelists, Shazna Nessa, has written about, um, it's actually much more effective to communicate these stories using visuals. Um, and I'm just gonna give you an example, and it's gonna take four of my 10 minutes, but Hans Rosling, who's in the video, is a much more eloquent speaker than I, and I think you can really see the utility of telling a story through visuals that you can pack in so much more information than you could otherwise. So whether you agree with the conclusions, or whether you notice that there are some things that go unexplained that don't make it precisely the best visualization ever, it is astonishing that so much information was distilled into four minutes. You think about how many book length manuscripts have been dedicated to that exact same topic. Data visualization is an incredibly powerful way to crunch some of these very large sets of data um, and make a story out of them, which is easily intelligible to average people. And that is a huge service. I'm gonna give you an example of how it could be relevant to your life, right? One of the things that we're doing at the museum in addition to teaching visual literacy is working with the business community. I'm thinking about ways that you can apply visual literacy to the things that you're doing as a company. Um, so this is not a shameless plug for that service. This is in fact just an example, but it's one to which I think you can all relate because presumably all of you, if you have already retired, good for you. Um, but if you haven't, then you're probably interested in retiring at some point, uh, which, which presupposes that you'll have a nest egg that you'll be able to spend, that you'll be able to use in that retirement. This is from uh, our investment consultants uh, report to us. We use a company called Callan Associates. And what it shows is it shows all of the asset classes that you can, they consider um, for our portfolio and shows how those asset classes are correlated with all other asset classes, right? Because part of the idea about having good savings is you need to diversify your portfolio so that way you can avoid, um, you can avoid excess market downturns um, or excess shock and volatility to your portfolio. Now, whether or not you agree with that and whether or not you think investment advice is worth paying for is uh, another conversation. However, there is no one, not even the most astute financial analyst who can look at this and tell you immediately off the bat what constitutes a diversified portfolio, because it makes no sense, right? It's a matrix of numbers carried out to three decimal points that range between negative one and positive one. There's no utility in this at all. Totally useless to everybody. Here's the same data displayed visually. You need a very simple algorithm, right? Um, as you can I don't even need to tell you because of your relationship to space that the things that are closer to each other are the ones that are more highly correlated and the things that are further away are not. So now if I were to ask any of you to pick a diversified portfolio of four assets, you just choose one from each group. And you do just as well as any stock picker would. And in fact, there's been research into how stock pickers perform and there's no correlation in performance year to year. So maybe you're better served doing it. Right? So there's a real argument that this is just there to obfuscate things, so you pay large premia to people. Now, this is not a stock picking bashing session, but it is to say that there isn't an area of your life data visualization can't touch and can't touch meaningfully. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna transition to our panel, hopefully having introduced you to data visualization and how it's cool and can answer interesting questions in a narrative way, but also how, right, using data sets as varied as financial data and global health, is applicable potentially to you in your everyday life. So what I've asked our panelists to do is I've asked them to each send me a data visualization or set of data visualizations about which they would like to speak. What we're gonna do is I'm gonna ask each of them to speak about the thing that he or she has sent and then we're gonna have a conversation and it might, I don't know if it frightens them, although I don't think it does. I don't actually know where the conversation is gonna go but I think that interesting points will emerge from their discussions about each of the visualizations that they've sent 
and we'll probe those hopefully further as a group in the question and answer session. So Shazna, I will navigate for you. Um, and given that the video has worked, I presume that we will be able to, there we are. Well, I'm, I'm really glad you showed the Hans Rosling video because I always point to him when I'm looking for good examples of helping an audience, helping people, sort of guiding them through something that could be otherwise rather dry and boring. I mean, to, sh to show these types of charts isn't always the most exciting thing if you're not, uh, if you're not creating curiosity, and I think Hans Rosling does a great job of that. So I've been in journalism for, for almost 15 years, um, sort of coincided with when the internet hit the mainstream. And so uh, journalism has gone through m many changes as many of our industries have, um, most notably in the visual world, particularly around graphics. We went from a very manual, static way of telling visual stories in, in a most simplified form, perhaps a chart, um, to something that's far more robust and algorithmic now. And uh, I, had the option of showing something I wasn't keen on, but I thought I'd be upbeat today and show you something I, I actually really liked. Um, and I stumbled across this a couple of years ago and um, thought it was relevant for, for this audience because we're at the Toledo Art Museum. But what I love about this actual whole story is that um, this, this is actually it. Maybe I can get up and, yeah, let me do that. Can I navigate it too? All right. So what I love about this is it's not one of these um, huge standalone interactive graphics. And again, to go back to the algorithmic part, because things have become algorithmic, we've had to create interfaces and we've had to get into interaction design. So journalists who once were using pen and paper to tell stories, in my world, my, my type, the type of journalist I am, we're hybrids, we're also designers, we're also programmers, and um, we've been pulling in skills from other disciplines. We've been pulling in statisticians into newsrooms, we've been pulling in artists and computer scientists, and this is all wonderful, but as a result, um, a lot of our work is sometimes skewed towards expert audiences. And what I think this does really well is actually bring it back to an average reader who may or may not be interested in, in the art market, but already I'm intrigued because it's for dummies. And I'm a, I feel good about that because it makes me feel less scared to uh, enter this um, story. And instead of it being this one huge visualization that's a massive chart that you've got to navigate, it actually breaks it down. It breaks it down into a na narrative. And, I, and, and I'm really happy that, Adam, you pulled out the word story in your introduction because stories are really important. Uh, depending, obviously, on, on your discipline, in my world, we need to tell stories. We can't just put a, do a huge data dump in front of our audiences especially in this media saturated world where we're all competing for uh, we're all competing for eyeballs we're all competing for engagement um, people don't have you know 20 minutes to try and figure out what something me means maybe sometimes they do but uh, a lot of the times with news right now they don't so anyway this was super alluring it pulled me in bits of text little charts and then you have things that are slightly more algorithmic like this timeline where you can go in and you can filter different, um, different periods in art and uh, dig more into how much things cost. One of my favorites is this, um, this bubble chart that talks about the most expensive artworks sold in auction. And you can actually recategorize things into, for example, um, let's see, men, women. And then you can see here is this circle represents men and this represents women and there's just one woman in here. And if you look at the color code down here, the pinks are drawings, blue silkscreen, gray painting, and the darker gray is sculpture. So I, I think it's just a fascinating way to explore a lot of information to get new insights. Um, on its own, I think this stands alone quite well, but I think it's even better because I can just continue on in the story. I know it seems simple enough, but I promise you, like we're not seeing enough of this. We're seeing silos in the way things are produced. So the data viz group is creating a data viz and the folks 
the photo team is creating photos, but we really need to be more story oriented where we're adapting our story to the best format where it makes best sense. So um, um, I'm super interested in vis visual literacy because I found in my industry uh, where we have a huge responsibility in, in, in to you know, part of democracy to inform people to help them make good decisions. We just had elections uh, recently. We saw the turnout. We saw, we've, we're seeing engagement. Uh, it's not as robust as it should be. And as people who are informing the public, how do, we, how do we create curiosity in the way an artist would? How do we blend that with um, the showmanship, perhaps, of uh, Hans Rosling, who uh, talks about his preparation in his videos. He compares himself to a sports commentator. That's, that's how he describes himself. And if that's what it takes, then maybe we should be experimenting with more of these, uh, these other disciplines to, uh, to make our work more engaging. Thank you, Shazna. So there are going to be sort of three compartmentalized little intros, and then we're going to have at it. So next, we're going to hear from Christina. Okay, I thought I was third this time. <laughs> we're we're seating boy, girl, boy, or boy, girl, boy, girl, but we're going to talk a girl, girl, boy. Okay. That's right, exactly. Um, so uh, so I, I chose uh, two visualizations that on the surface are technically similar to compare and contrast because if you it sort of deeper bearing, I think one is extraordinarily useful and one is not. Um, before I introduce these two, the, the visualizations I chose are very specifically around so-called soft topics um, because I think a lot of the frontier of math-based visualizations is actually in the domains of life that we don't typically think of. So, you know, we love to use examples from business or science or technology and certainly the majority of things that, uh, that cause customers to pay for software for my years at Splunk were in those domains. Um, but I think the interesting frontier of big data and data science and the visualization that goes hand in hand with all of that and thinking visually is coming back to the soft domains that um, we use as tools in visualization and actually getting insights about those domains. And I think that the last, you know, we've had a very technology driven society and, and you know, I'm somebody who comes from an art degree and art practitioner background in technology. Um, I think that, you know, we've mistaken the, you know, the tools for living with living. So, anyway, a little bit on that. Um, so over the left, I have a visualization. How many people in the room have ever um, been involved or aware of uh, Myers-Briggs um, personality tests? Okay. Um, what about Herman Brain Dominance Inventory, HBDI? One, two, okay. So, um, the left is a visualization the two of you in the audience may recognize from the Herman Brain Dominance Inventory System, which was developed, I think, in the 1950s, um, I think for GM, but it's used in organizational contexts. Um, similarly to the HPDI, sorry, the um, Myers-Briggs, the MBTI, to profile individuals and teams' thinking styles. Um, and the visualization on the left represents four quadrants um, in which each person is scored as to what percentage of their responses indicate that they're thinking one way versus another on four quadrants. Um, the, and I'm going to take a lot of explanation on this. And a lot of, by the way, the prejudice we have about visualizations is that they're not immediately obvious. If they take explanation, they're bad visualizations. I disagree. Um, and I'll sort of explain why, why I think that. Um, so the upper left of the HPDI is the analytical thinkers, the people who probably on Myers-Briggs are sensing and thinking heavily. Um, the upper right is the synthetic thinkers. So we probably would assume that most of the artists creating artworks in this museum, because that's the prejudice about artists, would be on the upper right. Um, the lower right is, so that's probably Myers-Briggs, more NTs. Um, the lower right is the um, people who think spiritually, interpersonally. Um, they're the people who always think in terms of relations to other people, who have insights into other people's emotions and think that's an important factor. They're probably the Fs on Myers-Briggs, maybe the NFs. 
Um, and the lower left are the people who think very process oriented. Have you followed the procedure? Have you followed the process? What process? Did you follow the accepted process to get this answer? Um, so, you know, these, these are all valid thinking styles. We need all of them. And a lot of what HBDI tries to do is look at the profiles and teams. So the particular visualization on the left, each line represents a series of data, which is one person in a combined team, but you can slice and dice it in lots of different ways. So you could compare demographics within a large organization. You could sort of say, what's the average score of your engineering team versus your marketing team, et cetera, et cetera. So the left represents a comprehensive system um, with certain assumptions about how things cluster. And the other significance I want to point out before I, moved, um, before I move on is the, the top of the model represents the two thinking styles that the designers of the system thought were more cerebral. The bottom of the model represents the two thinking styles that the designers of the system thought were more limbic or you know, sort of basic um, uh, thinking styles. And the left represents more um, logical and the right represents more, um, more uh, creative or, or so left brain, right brain kind of thinking. Now, I know a lot of the sort of whole brain theory has been debunked from a scientific perspective, but it still provides a useful metaphor. So what I like about the, the one on the left, and we used it extensively at Splunk, growing from 10 people to close to 1,000 before I left, which brings up all kinds of interpersonal issues. Um, what I liked about it was that once people got scored and we started with the executive team and then we moved it to all of our teams, it provided a very useful lingua franca, a visual lingua franca within the company for something as soft as people's personality style and thinking styles and how we were working. Um, and people would post these images, people would talk about, you know, there's the color, is another dimension used here. So if I come back to the visual literacy framework of space and color and line, it's an ugly graphic on the left, but it makes enormously good use of all of the principles of visual literacy. Um, so people would have posters on their walls of their particular shape and would have pride and sense of kinship with people of a similar shape, which sometimes created strange new kinships within the company, strange new alliances. People would talk about, oh, you know, Rob, you're just being yellow. You know, stop being so yellow. Can we just stick to the facts here? And it becomes fun, you know. So, um, and so people start to talk visually as well as think visually. So. I love the left, and I'm using it because doing a mobile app in the art space, I'm looking at a lot of the same data, hint, hint, as um, what Shazna just presented. Um, but I'm also looking at much more granular, much more granular data, and I'm thinking about ways that we can create visualizations for something as um, soft as your art tastes and art responses which for me is very similar in terms of the so-called qualitative nature of that or subjective nature of that as, as people's thinking styles. So spending a lot of time with those kinds of visualizations. And then someone pointed out to me, actually, our engineer, um, who is more of a wine aficionado, pointed out that there's this wine visuals app on the right, which I'm far less familiar with than I am with the HBDI, but I'm, I can be critical of it. I know nothing about the people behind it, so if you have anything to do with it and you're in the audience, I apologize. But um, apparently, uh, flavor wheels are a common are a common thing in wine, and the ones I've seen that seem to be from more professional sources have lots and lots of spokes in the flavor wheels, and there are alternate visualizations that recast that as as streams of flavors and so forth. But um, the one on the upper right is a radar chart that is structurally similar to the HPDI that I like in that. Um, they're scoring on different axes and they're presented in a radial manner. Um, but there is not a lot of, sin of significance to what's neighboring each other. Um, there's not a lot of particular significance to the volume. So another criticism of, of star-based radar charts versus um, spatial radar, ch radar charts is that Unlike the area charts we are used to in more common visualizations, um, the length of the axis is the is the indicator here. So there's 
there's a little bit of overemphasized emphasis in terms of the space. And the worst criticism is that eight, eight is just too many axes. Um, so that brings me to sort of the last point before I um, turn it over, which is um, I think that the mass press, I mean, I've been involved with log data projects since Microsoft in 1997 and visualizations based on log data, which we now think of as big data. So what's log data? Every time stamped record of anything that possibly can be recorded. When you go to a website, you're you're generating hundreds of log events in a few minutes. Um, with uh, location technologies, if you walk around a space, you're generating hundreds of, of time stamped records. It's all this raw data. And I think one of the things that people are not very literate about is, is the selection of axes and the design choices that get made. So to pick on the art market stuff I just saw today for the first time that Shazna showed me, there are design choices about what counts as a painting versus what counts as a sculpture versus what counts as a drawing. And I hope walking around this museum, um, you can see that things are not quite that black and white. Now, we have to make those choices, but the real promise of big data is that ordinary people can not just consume visualizations, but can create visualizations, can communicate visually, which means they get to make their own choices about dimensions and labels and cuts and um, and technology should be, you know, technologists should be providing tools for everybody to do that and tools for the math behind it and the visualization. So I'll stop there. And we're going to probe that in just a bit. But first, the floor is yours, Ray. Let me change the slide for you. Great, thank you. you. Click through with uh, that, actually. Okay. Thanks, Adam. Yep. Um, this is a visualization that some of you might be familiar with. Um, has anyone seen this before? No. Okay, maybe not. Um, this is uh, from Optech, which is um, a group pre presenting uh, visualizations of the internet. So this was created in 2003. Um, each node is a website, and the colors represent its location. Um, you know, it's it, it's interesting. It shows com uh, the internet is complex. Um, I would argue that there's not it's not that data rich, although um, it was quite you know it it for in our, in our discussion it was at the time I think uh, very insightful for people, um, which we were discussing earlier today with Christina. Um, going to the next slide, this is um, a graphic and it's actually part of a still from a video created by um, a hacker group of, of a botnet. Uh, network and it shows um, internet usage over time and you can see sort of uh, where concentrations of internet use is based on time of the day and then you start seeing more information about say uh, internet usage um, distribution of the technology and access to the technology which um, I would argue provides more um, more information so just it's I wanted to present these um, these examples today because um, in my practice you know, you know, increasingly we get we get requests for oh we need a data visualization oh you know big data you know they see an article they see something in the New York Times or or something like that um, and then we always as in the design process we always could step back and say okay well what's your intention what's your purpose what are you trying to communicate um, and then we can sort of say okay what's the right tool do you really need a uh, data visualization in this case and things like that. Um, and so, you know, because it, it, it goes back to, I like the, again, I agree with Shazna and Adam's idea of like s telling stories. So the data has a story to tell. What's the intention? What's your point of view? These are all the key questions. We, s we start with the, the question that you're trying to answer or and the information you're trying to communicate, and then we talk about solutions. Um, and then in the design process too, you know, we, in the, in the sort of perspective of um, visual literacy, you know, there's a, it's funny, we always talk about like we hate the, the, the pie graph, right, um, a pie chart because they're hard to read and you really can't compare two side by side. Sometimes they are appropriate, but it's always like the knee jerk, you know, sometimes it might be just be that I know how to make this in Excel, so this is the one I use, right? So it could be the tool. Um, and, and so there's this interesting uh, sort of dialogue that uh, is part of my job that I think I like most in like what's the right solution trying to move people perhaps out of their comfort zone, showing them uh, you know, all the possible solutions. And I think in terms of data visualization, the, um, 
it's, it's very complicated and we'll get to, I think, in the last slide. But the, in the visual um, component of that, it is sort of, you know, testing the water, seeing like what's the most appropriate solution for your um, design uh, problem. So let's pause there, right? So, and we're not going to show the last slide. We'll, we'll save it um, for if appropriate, although I suspect that it will be. Um, so you've heard three different perspectives on data visualization. There are some commonalities and definitely some tensions. Um, so, so let's start actually just to ground everyone before diving in. Christine, I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you an unfair question because there's a time limit on it. Can you talk about the definition of big data, log data, in two minutes or less, just so people understand exactly what it is and that it's actually a much more nuanced concept than I think it gets credit for? Um, so big data was a label that began to be current um, about three, four years ago. The Economist did a cover story on big data, and I remember walking to a conference room saying, we finally have a name to go public on. Um, but. Um, so big data really is about the fact that we have, and it, we're generating an increasing amount of data exhaust, which is um, a term that's getting applied to all of this frequently time series data that is now actually getting captured. It's always happened. I mean, that's one of the things I think about is we've always had this data, we just haven't actually cap captured it. So we're capturing, you know, we could capture that I walked across his room every step, you know, it's like all of this detail. But the fact that we're capturing the details of people's virtual fo footsteps on websites, et cetera. Um, so that's driving the volume. Uh, the velocities is coming along with that. So the, the data is, truth is constantly changing because the accumulation of all these data points is making it very fast. So volume, velocity, and, um, uh, variability, so this data is extraordinarily variable, which speaks to this sort of dimensionality. And the set, and this sort of big data trend is around where we're generating, we're arguably, arguably capturing rather than generating more of this data than ever before. Um, we are now having uh, technologies that are capable of storing this and retaining it for longer periods of time in complete or higher, at least, fidelity, rather than summarization. So it's down to the raw data is always there. The soup of raw data is always there, not just summary data. Um, and we have sets of tools that allow humans to navigate the soup of data, and that may be navigated down to that detail level and zoom down to, okay, exactly where did you go on the, you go on the web yesterday? and what did you click on, and an aggregate, um, and tools for aggregating this data, which is partially the tools that can, in massively parallel ways, we used to be only be able to summarize data on one logical computer. We now have massively parallel systems uh, that are accessible to anybody who can make an Amazon, uh, an AWS, Amazon Cloud account, um, and the last, but certainly not least, is visualizations to, as people navigate this data and find individual in interesting cuts in it, um, to tell stories with that data so anybody can do what our Swedish scientists did. Right. Thank you. That was, in fact, just over two minutes. So that's big data in two minutes or less. Right. The key takeaway are the three views, right? Velocity, volume, variability. So. I bring that, I ask Christina to do that because you hear about data visualization very frequently within the context of big data, but of course, to a point Ray made, it needn't be, right? So technically speaking, right, being very precise, the visualization of financial data that I showed you at the outset is summary data. We're looking at correlations of asset classes, right? So there's a lot more data underlying that from which the correlations are generated. But that was a very small data set of correla correlations that could be made much more meaningful by looking at a visualization. So there's finding meaning in the soup, but there's also finding meaning in more targeted ways. And I think the key there, and I want to bring it back to this idea of story and narrative, um, I think the key there is determining the type of story you want to tell from whatever the data is at whatever scale and telling that story effectively for that audience. Right, and I heard a lot of that in 
what you were talking about, Shazna. So I want to ha- yeah, allow I you to comment on that. I might even add, maybe it's not, maybe it's it's pulling out the stories, but also showing people how to pull out their own stories, which is where I totally agree with you where, um, you know, I was a designer for a long time and designers are taught that if you have to explain something, then your design is not good, it's bad. In this world though, I do think we need to explain things because things are more complex. If we don't explain them, we're going to have to simplify them to very, very simple levels. And we have a very, very rich, complex world now through this data. So I'm a big fan of explaining things. In fact, that's what Hans Rosling did. He explained things. Um, But what he also did was teach us how to look at these things so next time maybe we can pull out our own stories from it. So um, I don't want to cut off this entire, like this brilliant new universe where we can actually also pull our own meaning from things. But I do think that we, in journalism, we do definitely have a responsibility to pull out what we um, as editors and reporters believe are the key things that people should be uh, should be taking away. Um, but then they can also play around with that data themselves. So prompted by that, but sort of moving it to Ray, although feel free to interject, and if it gets too hostile, I'll jump in. Um, but mm-hmm. but so as a, as a user experience designer, right, so a large part of that, I think, relies on what are the default settings, right? So people will explore things, but they'll explore things within the framework that you provide them initially, right? That start is not random and is very intentional. Mm-hmm. So how do you think about designing an interactive data visualization um, that allows people to explore in relatively uninhibited or unbiased ways. Could you just sort of comment on that and what effective practice is? Sure. Um, I think it all starts with audience first and really understanding um, who you're designing for or creating for. So if you know your the people you're designing for, the audience or the users are um, experts, then you don't need to explain the perhaps even the charts or the underlying data because they'll just know. Um, if it's a lay audience, just main mainstream um, readers or viewers on a, like a broad website, then you, know, you might need some scaffolding around the, the sort of the wet whatever um, you're creating, whether it be a data visualization or just an article. Um, so it all, st- in it all starts from the, from the audience perspective and then you sort of go from there. And then, you're but you're exactly right. The default settings are um, hugely important and probably not thought about enough because you will send people down a certain path based on what you um, originally present to them. Because most people often don't even bother changing those kinds of settings. So it starts. So there's definitely again the intention that you present is um, always tri- going to be critical too. So thinking about something as varied as art taste, which is clearly going to require an awful lot of scaffolding. Right? Can you comment at all about just your f- general thought processes around, so how do you build, so open question for all of you, but obviously like moving down the line, how do you think about building that scaffolding? Well, um, at a technical level at Splunk, we took log data and let the users of the system apply their own tagging effectively to individual records and have rule sets for how tags would be auto-applied. And those tags could become dimensions on the fly. So this notion of sort of late binding schema. You don't know the questions you want to ask when you store the data and you prepare it for analysis. And that's really a frontier of, of systems. When I start thinking about this for sort of um, the sort of art, art taste, um, uh, you know, what is, what is art? Um, it is a conversation between the viewer and the maker at some level, and I'm and I'm sort of uh, been spending a lot of my time immersing in Duchamp's writing on this lately. Um, I think that I think that the starting points for me are um, using the crowd to do the labeling, not in this way of the crowd somehow getting it right and making the right dis- decision that experts were over is it painting or sculpture, but what are the responses? So. It's a vague answer, but I think, but I think, not having limited taxonomies, n- um, rejecting the notion of taxonomies, but not having the shallowness of of the sort of, you know, now in the in the rearview mirror, Web 2.0 folksonomies. So, but I feel like there is a so back to journalism. I feel like there's a real tension there with like the 1,000 word limit, right? And the digestible, as you said, um, small. So, the anchoring of expectations around attention to news, right? How, d- how, 
how it's hard to avoid taxonomies and buckets um, because whether or not they're precise, they must they are useful, especially in journalism. So how do you think about as someone who just said that you agree with a lot of that? How do you think about reconciling those two things? Um, I think it's happening already. Uh, in that, um, let me think of an example. I mean, already you're seeing, we're seeing uh, a rejection of the beat reporter, the idea that, um, I mean, I said it earlier on, I, I'm, a, I'm a hybrid journalist. I, I can report, but I can also program and I can design my own stuff. I can make my stuff. And that is a huge, um, it's also a huge burden mm -hmm. because you're, you're having to constantly be learning all the time and it's, Journalism schools now are offering dual degrees where you can be a, an engineer, and you can do a dual degree in engineering and in journalism, which is amazing. Um, but uh, I mean, the idea that you brought up earlier of uh, you ask a question that you're trying to solve, that's good, but I'm actually also interested in what are the stories we don't know about because we're we only have we have the capacity to ask certain questions, but there are so many things we don't know in the data set. Um, and so there there have been some development of tools where uh, data obviously data is not j always numbers. It can also be text. It can be in the form of a WikiLeaks dump. It can be uh, Snowden documents. It can be Freedom of Information Act requests, which end up being stacks and stacks of PDF documents that then have to be cleaned up. Um, but uh, there have been tools created and used in academia, in uh, in law, where information, the, the text information is visualized into a map, and then journalists are then able to go in, rather than make their own assumptions about what stories are in there, they actually have a huge uh, view of uh, of what potential stories they were missing that are in that uh, that is in the data. So I think it's uh, I think we have to approach it from both angles. Yes, as humans, we have a we we think we know what our audience wants, um, and we think we know we think we know what we know we think we know everything. Well, we don't think we know everything, but we think uh, we know a lot, um, and so we'll make those assumptions and do sort of more traditional journalism. But then there's the other way of looking at it, which is what don't we know about this, and what are the tools we can use um, to find patterns that we would not have seen before. And in your experience, is there a uh is there any systematic difference between the visualizations or tools that are built for aiding story discovery and telling the story itself? I actually think that we are using uh, tools too much for the end, for our end audience. Some of these tools are meant for us to then, to then sort of take it to another layer. Um, there's just this proliferation of data tools, data visualization tools. That doesn't mean every data visualization that's being created is actually very good. Um, I mean, we've seen it in other iterations of multimedia tools where you could make slideshows, you could plug in a picture and a piece of audio. Um, that doesn't mean you know how to tell a story. So I think there's sort of fundamental learnings, visual literacy, media literacy, or you know, there's so fundamental learnings, fundamental core truths that we have to, you know, we have to understand before we can we can use the tools, but that doesn't mean we're using them very well. So Ray, you spoke about knowing the audience, right? Um, so could you talk about that a little bit in the context of not, are they subject matter experts per se, but from the perspective of data visualization, how visually literate they are and how that enters your thinking? Sure, um, because it, it, the data visualization literacy will sort of, there's two sides of the and they're, they're obviously very related. One is the creator and people creating these things because there are so many tools and this expectation, oh, we should be you know, presenting um, this information in this new way, um, which is actually isn't that new, but now becoming increasingly popular, but then also for the audience, for the readers. And there is going to be this education because um, process going on on both sides for the creators and the, the audience because um, you know, it, it's this uh, sort of, New, new way of looking at information, and there's going to be this learning process, um, and the the it's more than the tool because I think something that uh, Shazna's comment triggered is like you know garbage in, garbage out. If you really don't understand the data, if you don't really understand how to to analyze it, the tool isn't really going to get you there. And you know you can create these um, 
uh, you know, information graphics or whatever you're producing that can be, if not just factually wrong, misleading. Um, so I'm going to interrupt with the, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say that also goes back to what you were saying about Excel. Like <laughs> if, if your tool only lets you do one thing, then you're, you're sort of narrowing yourself to this, this right. format and not thinking about. Well, and uh, I'm so uh, going to lead into this slide, which is your Venn diagram, um, which of course was generated by the person with the engineering degrees, right? <laughs> but very much to that point, right? That was a perfect lead in. So maybe visual literacy is by itself, right? Or on its own, an incredibly interdisciplinary concept, but maybe you could just talk a little bit about this in relation to what you were just saying. Um, sure, so, you know, and just in some of the email conversations we were having, it struck me um, of, of uh, distilling this to an uh, data visuals that data visualization literacy, um, really needs, uh, it's, it's, again, two, two very intricately uh, connected ideas, visual literacy, which I think everyone is familiar with, but then also math literacy. It doesn't mean you need um, you know, a, a math background or a strong math background, but you know, there'll be new principles that will be important, like you know, that ratios are the same thing as proportions or the same things as percentages. Um, things that you might not have thought about since you know, your, your high school geometry or math class, um, but you know, it will become very important in, in that you're now using this new tool set to communicate an idea. And we're coming down the home stretch here, but I want to bring it back to art quickly, and I wasn't sure we were going to get there, so this was our backslide, but we're gonna, I'm going to kick it to you, Christina, to talk about this and get us out to questions with us. So uh, I took the liberty of borrowing uh, an image um, from an artist named Adrian Siegel, um, who I didn't know anything about until I went to a Lisa talk, um, uh, Leaders in Software and Art is a group that does, um, that does talks with and events with artists who are working at the frontiers of technology and art. So Adrian Siegel is a young woman in, um, in the Bay Area with a degree in furniture design from an, art, from an art and design school. And uh, she creates furniture technique-based art objects that are based on heavy-duty data crunching and data analysis. So this chest of drawers, each of those, see the lines, those are all drawers. The, that's actually a three-dimensional visualization of public data from 31 years of of water density and snowpack, and I'm, uh, science is a really weak point for me. I just want to, I would add to your Venn diagram, there's lots of other areas. Then. <laughs> but um, she's, trying to, she's trying to tell an emotional story with the data, which uh, she had thinks of storage, the drawers, as metaphor for water content and snow, and she wants to provoke, provoke questions that there aren't necessarily very clear answers to and make us thoughtful about, well, the years that there's low snowpack, um, that we didn't have a lot of precip precipitation, there's not a lot of storage, there's not a lot for us to keep in reserve, so the drawers are smaller. So um, it's just a very poetic idea, and for me this is really the extreme of visualizations. You would never look at this chest of drawers and say, oh, that's about snowpack. Um, but the stories behind what's, what's visual, I think, are really interesting and important. Right, so the, confer the conference theme is the art of seeing from ordinary to extraordinary. The thesis is that there are myriad applications for visual literacy across a lot of disciplines, and you've heard a number of them represented here today. Um, but it's being hosted in a museum, right? So useful to bring it back to art and show that even something like data visualization, where you mightn't have thought it, actually enters into the day-to-day -day practice of what we do here. So with that, I'd ask you to please thank our panelists.